Author Blanchard, guide on Gibraltar, Minister of External Affairs, Tourism and Immigration, is also the mayor of Port Louis. And a notable sportsman. He is leader of the Barcelona Social Democrats since 1966 and became leader of the opposition in 1967. In 1969, he joined the government of national unity, which is mainly concerned with industrial development and tourism. The Minister of Tourism and Honourable Alex Rima, Minister of State, are now working on new plans for tourist expansion. Ce Gaïdan était un amoureux de la justice et il avait un profond respect pour la loi et les institutions. Thus, he had a great respect for the rule of law. Ce Gaïdan appealed for poor people with the same devotion as for high profile clients. His life was full of passion. 
I will first go to Alex Sikarel to pay tribute to this exceptional man of high intellect who was an institution in himself. Le sacrifice de soi-même n'est pas difficile lorsqu'il est brûlé pour la passion, la passion d'une grande aventure. Fin de citation. Je dirais donc que la vie de Sakai Dantifal a été une grande et passionnante aventure. Ladies and gentlemen, I now have the pleasure to call the president of the Middle Temple Association of Mauritius, Mr. Richard de Riaou, Sino Council. Mr. de Riaou is the president of the association and also former High Commission of Mauritius in Pakistan. Mr. de Riaou has a very rich career in the legal profession and has at many occasions appeared before the Court of Justice against and together with Sir Gaetan Schwab. Mr. de Riaou has been elevated as Sino Council in 2010. I salute and the highlight the presence of the respected speakers, starting with ex-judge Vilod uh, Bolel, the president of the Bar Council, Nargis Bandel, uh, Jacques Panlouz, my young friend, and uh, Paul Chonglong. They have all been chosen on the basis that they have been closely associated with uh, Sir Gaetan, and they have very personalized experience during his practice at the bar, and they want to share it. I also salute the presence of uh, Professor Toro, uh, President of the Law Reform Commission, uh, Vice President of the Association, uh, Milan Mitarban, members of the legal profession, new, newly called barristers, Milan Temple, and otherwise, they I salute your presence and I welcome you again. My introduction is simply to say we caught the opportunity of the 90th birth anniversary and it has been going on and this is actuality for some time now and I, was, I regret not having been to Congo for this major event but I know it was a success and as he rightly pointed out he was a man or bear exceptional and as of today we are going to focus the rule of law Sergei Tonjula QC and the rule of law and in that I'll, I have made sure that there is each speaker will speak on one aspect of it. one will speak as a lawyer practicing a uh, lawyer barrister at the assizes and he's highlighted uh, high uh, flawed cases and the success of the assizes then as a legislature, and then as a human right defender. And I'm sure you will have a very illuminating and interesting, instructive and inspiring uh, discussion. Well, he used to tell, he used to say to me, at one time I visited him at Wongo during a, a trial where we were together for several abuse, and he, he, he said, come in the car, we'll drive together, and I'll, we'll talk about the case. On the way, because this is how is he operated, he was preparing his case during the travel from uh, Van Gogh to Torquiz. Yekoko, we just finished his time, there were three of us lawyers. Par rapport à quelle question, this moment will be a travail. Monsieur Pedal, it's quite a job. He would go back to my client, but I haven't done my job. He says, no, you get the result and you show him that, what it is all about. He had in mind a legal point on the information which was defective, which he saw, and he said, do not mess up by putting evidence which might re remedy or uh, cure the defect as it is. So this is Guy Tonjubal, who is exceptional in that sense. Now, I will not dwell long, longer, except to say that this is an occasion where every year we have been doing it, and, uh, but this is the first time we're holding a memorable lecture, and we've started to say Guy but Usually we receive the new barristers. Well, I don't call them colleagues now, they are fully fetched barristers, and they're sitting on the right. They are, it so happens, and 80% of them are middle templars, and we have invited all of them indiscriminately, and they will be presented uh, one by one just for the purposes of welcoming them at the bar. So I will congratulate the barristers, wish them luck and success, and uh, make sure everybody has says it and we say it's, a, it's an honorable profession and we like to believe that we have to be absolutely very 
of high ethical standards. This is what makes the difference between us and others in the sense that we do not deviate when it comes to the code of conduct. Without much ado, I, complete, I close here to say that have a nice time in the discussions and I pass on to Olivier. Thank you. To me, it must be a unique lifetime opportunity to be able to say a few words about the exceptional man that Sagado was. I was privileged to have him as a friend. I first came to know him in 1970 as a young lawyer when he asked me to defend a few of his political agents before the district court of Quebec, some of whom betrayed him in 1989 when he was arrested. He told me that I would not get any retainer fees, but I would acquire experience. He also warned me that some magistrates in those days were in the habit of being harsh on young lawyers. Indeed, when I appeared in court in Quebec, what Sagata had told me proved to be true. I hope magistrates today have changed. To talk about Sagata in relation to the rule of law is not simply an exercise in cataloging the numerous cases in which he appeared and where his incisive legal ability could make the difference. These cases are a living testimony of how Sagata has contributed to the evolution of so many principles in the field of criminal law and fundamental rights. But Sagata and the rule of law also requires an impression in his immense political contribution to the country. In one of several books written on Sagata by Alain Gaudreau-Jansi, when he was asked what his mission was, he answered, and I quote, Quand je regarde les choses avec du recul, je pense qu'elles consistaient d'abord à réconcilier le peuple mauricien et ensuite protéger la liberté en instaurant un bien-être économique. C'est ce que je suis venu faire en politique. Mais il faut encore se battre pour les libertés quand elles ne sont jamais acquises. It was his belief in the rule of law and his passion for fundamental rights and the welfare of the people of Mauritius that urged him to enter into a coalition in 1969 when the country was divided into almost half, both politically and racially. He wanted to reconcile the people after the trauma of the communal riots of 1968. Sagata was a man of many facets, a lawyer, a politician, a literary person, a diplomat, and above all, a great visionary. Though he has been a brilliant lawyer, he is better known as a politician in the public. As a barrister, he never blew his own trumpet. He never bluffed in his presentation of a case, however much passion he would put in while handling a case. But as a politician, he had that talent to exhibit himself as a man of the people. Sagata was an eminent jurist who always expressed his views fearlessly in court. One may not necessarily agree with him, but it was a pleasure to listen to him develop his views. He explains how he was inspired by Jules Kenny, an eminent lawyer. And I quote, Je n'hésite pas à le dire, il m'a appris à avoir une approche, une attitude envers le métier d'avocat et la vie en général. J'ai hérité de lui cette manière dure et théâtrale de contre-interroger les témoins, cette façon de traiter les magistrats, mais toujours avec correction. Moi qui m'aime, bah, toujours avec correction, laissez les discuter. And one of the great compliments he received came from a former Chief Justice, Sir Maurice Atou Adrien, as he recalls, quote, Un jour, le juge Atou Adrien m'a dit, Lorsque vous plaidiez, j'ai fermé les yeux, et je croyais entendre Jules Kenny. Quel compliment pour moi. And of course. Sir Sagaran Boulam, the former Prime Minister, also recognized the talent of Sagaitan as a lawyer, when he told his old ministers, quote, Faites attention, Vous pouvez chercher des emmerdes politiques autant que vous voulez avec Duval, mais ne l'emmenez jamais sur le terrain légal, vous perdriez à coup sûr. End of quote. 
The concept of the rule of law cannot be discussed in a vacuum. To talk about Sagata and the rule of law requires us to drive and delve into the significance of that concept that has been in existence since Darcy discussed it in his famous work, Introduction to the Study of the Law of the Constitution. And more recently, eminent jurists like Michael Kirby, who has been a judge in Australia for 34 years, and Lord Bingham, who was a senior law lord in England, have given their own perception of the concept of the rule of law. To place in its proper perspective the contribution of Sagaita to the rule of law, I believe it would be just and important to refer to how these eminent jurists, Kirby and Bingham, have discussed that concept and how the contribution of Sagaita fits in that approach. Judge Kirby expresses the following view, quote, as a principle, the rule of law is essential. However, it is only so as it safeguards and promotes the higher principle of justice. Justice for all, harmony in society, and its laws to justice. Not simply justice for the majority as expressed in democratic elections, but justice also for minorities. Justice especially for the vulnerable and unpopular minorities. It is when minorities demand the protection of the law that the discipline of the law is tested. And of course. And precisely, Sagata, in one of the books written on him, shows his adherence to the rule of law irrespective of race or communities, following the racial riots of 1968. At that time, the late Elias Uzirani and Sagata appeared as defense counsel for many of those who were involved in these riots. And Sagata explains the strategy he devised to show that in these troubled times, reconciliation was the philosophy. He would not defend people in his own community and left that responsibility to Elias Uzirani. He defended those who did not belong to his own community. Many of us who have been practicing in Mauritius would readily agree that Sagata has been a model and an inspiration to me. The cases in which he has appeared on appeal against convictions will continue to inspire generations of lawyers to come. And here I can do no better than to refer to one of the principles that Lord Bingham states as the component of the rule of law, namely that the law must afford adequate protection for fundamental human rights. And Sagata was a firm believer and a staunch defender of fundamental rights. I would just like briefly to refer to some of the decisions on this topic. When Sagata was facing a serious criminal charge and had to appear at a preliminary inquiry that was held before the district court of law, he challenged a number of matters before the Supreme Court. He lost all the cases, but he judgments bear testimony to the evolution of criminal jurisprudence in the context of fundamental rights. Though he was an accused and did not argue these cases personally, all the motions or applications made to the Supreme Court no doubt bear his imprint. The points raised in these cases reveal the unique legal flair of Sagarna. Sagarna also appeared in one of the first cases on the right of an accused to be represented by counsel. All those who have been in the profession for a long time know the case of Burana. But in that case, Sagata not only raised the point of the right of somebody to be defended by counsel, he also raised many points, including the relationship that would exist between bench and bar. <coughs> he very deftly included in his argument the concept of the rule of law that should permeate the approach of the courts and the legal profession when deciding on the fundamental rights of a citizen. He was also advocating the existence of a strong and independent legal profession and the relations between bench and bar. That point, was it, that point was the subject matter of a positive observation from the then, then Chief Justice, Sir Michel Rivalon, who observed that smooth relations should exist between the courts and the bar of this country. 
relations which must, in the end, have far-reaching effect on the administration of justice. Sargata was also famous for having appeared in a number of cases at the Assizes. I haven't personally watched him at the Assizes, though I have, I have appeared against him in a few cases when I was a law officer at the office of the DPP. I still remember in one case I was prosecuting, Sargata was very relaxed and appeared to be sleeping in court. <coughs> so I chose that opportunity to ask a leading question to the witness. Sargata, with his eyes still closed and in a sitting position, objected by saying, My friend is treading on dangerous ground. I mentioned this just to show you how alert he could be in court. In Assad's cases, Sargata exuded an unparalleled confidence. And very often, I asked him when he was appearing at the Assizes whether it was Sargata the lawyer or Sargata the showman. He gave me a simple answer. He told me, Abhya Sazas, you must be an actor and not a strict lawyer. Many friends have told me that watching Sargata Abhya Sazas was like watching a play at the theatre. The man was simply convincing, and no wonder that he managed to successfully convince a jury in many cases. Sagata readily accepted to appear for the then head of the public service, Mr. Basha, who was accused of murder. That case provoked communal tensions as the victim belonged to the general population. Many people were mad at Sagata for having accepted that brief, but that did not bother him. His belief in the rule of law and his belief in helping others from his side was needed carried the day. And so they asked him, whether he would still have defended the accused if the victim had been his sister. And two to himself, Sagata said, yes, I would have defended my brother. Unfortunately, he did not leave to see the outcome of the case that was taken over by another eminent barrister, Samar David. Basha was acquitted and Samar agreed that the foundation for the successful outcome of the case for the defense had been laid by Sagata. And true to himself, he won a case even in death. One of the famous cases in which he appeared was the case known as the Shaykh Hussain case. It will be recalled that mm -hmm. Shaykh Hussain had made serious allegations against the police and the former Prime Minister, Sassi Bussagar Ramulam. He accused them of having been behind the fire that broke out at the premises of the newspaper Le Mauritian in 1978. Sargata had just been defeated at the 1976 election and he was coming back at the bar. He was quite surprised and honored when his services were detained by the former police commissioner, Fulena, to represent him at the fire inquiry before Magistrate Hamdaka. Sargata could have refused to take the brief because he was, he believed Fulina did not like him. But he did ac accept the brief because he said that case helped him make his comeback to the bar. And he explains his stand and I quote, Lorsque Fulina vient me voir pour le défendre après certaines allégations formulées contre lui, c'est un peu pour moi une consécration. Fulina ne m'aimait pas beaucoup, je crois. Et voilà que c'est lui qui m'offre l'occasion de revenir à l'avant de la scène et j'ai voulu mener à bien cette affaire. End of quote. Cheikh Hussain was a witness who, by his talent, managed to convince some politicians of the truth of his allegations. It was quite an uphill task to demolish his credibility. But in the stroke of genius, Sagata managed to prove that the man was a psychopath and he demolished him. We know that Sagata was against the death penalty. I still remember his speech in Parliament when he brought a motion for the abolition of that punishment. He had his own style to describe that punishment. He put it in context when he said, quote, La première qualité que je n'aime pas, c'est la pratique de la stricte justice. Je déteste ceux qui disent être des justes. C'est une qualité qui est trop forte pour l'hypocrisie. Je n'aime pas les gens qui n'hésitent pas à donner aux hommes le pain de flèche pour le monde. La peine de mort fait partie de cette stricte justice, ce côté Shiloh, bien au 
and of good. Charlotte also appeared in many constitutional cases. In 1974, he challenged the decision of the police to censure his articles that should have appeared in one of his new newspapers. He, he appeared in the case where he challenged the election of the Speaker of the National Assembly <coughs> on the ground that the Speaker could not be elected on the same day on which the previous Speaker was the vote. I would just like, before I end, to recall my last meeting with Sadaka. It was on the 3rd of May, two days before he passed away. He came to see me in my chambers to make a copy of the judgment in which he appeared before me and another judge. I had written the judgment. We had a copy, he read the judgment. He pointed out to me that my colleague had signed the judgment. And I said, of course. And Sadaka told me, Il a signé parce qu'il n'a rien compris. Those were the last words I heard from Sagata. I still try to figure out what he meant by these words. Was it a bad judgment? Was it a good judgment? Did he have any issue with that judge? I won't mention his name. But this was Sagata. To talk about Sagata in a few minutes is not doing justice to the man. And he may take offense as is only pretending to be dead. But still, I hope that this brief survey has given all of you, especially the young generation, an idea who Sargaitan the lawyer was and who Sargaitan the man was. Thank you. It is an honor and privilege to address you this afternoon to contribute to our friend Sargaitan the man Tracy. <coughs> Most attendees this afternoon in this room may not have had the pleasure of hearing Sargaitan at the bar, let alone appearing together with Boyd The year was 1993. I was very really new to the profession and very much shadowing here with the QC then. Both Gaita and Guy were retained by Dr. Nagumarina, the leader of the opposition, to appear in the case where the then Attorney General was seeking to declare Mr. Ramos seat vacant. Before then, I had met Gaita casually in the court corridors. This was the first time that I met him professionally. We were in his chambers in early in the morning and going through the authorities and affidavits. Gaeta immediately accepted his suggestion to call Paul Béranger, then advisor to the Prime Minister as witness, to give evidence as regards the convening of the National Assembly in the early hours, at dawn, one would say, of the 26th of January, 1993. Dawn meant then, 9 o'clock in the morning. Many council would have hesitated to, set, to take such a bold decision. Bold decision, why? Because Béranger was then advisor to the Prime Minister. And calling him in a case when the Attorney General was seeking to declare the post of the leader of the opposition vacant was indeed a very bold decision to take. Only those blessed with fine intellect and great advocacy skills would do this, and that was serious. The term colorable device takes from that decision that was handled in that case. Gaito and I crossed swords only once. That was in the 1995 case of Bam versus Bam. Of course, it was a family law case. It was an application by a mother to relocate to Singapore with her three children of tender age, then age 10, 8, and 7. I was still very junior. It was a challenge to take on this formidable and larger than life figure as an opener. Both my contracting attorney and mentor encouraged me and convinced me that I could rise to the challenge. The hearing was found over a few days. At no time did Gaeta have a condescending and derogatory attitude towards me. I cannot remember, though, whether I had the benefit of being addressed to as Kuku. He was counsel during the Keys case, and we had a fight at arm's length. The outcome was, of course, in my favor. I have gone through the scanty scout archives of the Bar Association and spoken to some of his peers, and have not, been, uh, and have not had any evidence of Kai Tohari led the profession. But then he was busy leaving the country which no doubt was a much bigger achievement. 
Gaitos practiced at the bar has been for nearly 41 years. His first reported case was in 1967 in the electoral petition of Benjamin and others versus Fuqua and others, in, and the returning officer for the constituency in the fall, Port North, Mount Island, in 1967. Uh, it is reported 1967, MR, 135, probably the younger generation. Now we are in the process of hearing so many electoral petitions. Uh, it's worthwhile reading the case of uh, Benin versus Fuqua. In fact, there were three judgments, one of them, in fact, moving for striking out of the petition. So if said actuality to go back to Berlin and Fuqua. And of course, the case of Berlin and Fuqua would speak volumes to me for personal and family reasons. His last case at the sizes was, as Mr. Justice Puden said, was in the case of the state versus Sir Basha, Sir Basha, sorry, in 1996. Gaitan's contribution in holding the rule of law has been invaluable and of prime importance, especially in the formative years of Mauritius. Thank you. Je trouve que d'avoir à parler de Gaëtan, on se concerne. Mais d'avoir à parler en français. Pourquoi en français Vous savez, à l'époque, quand il est entré en politique, Gaëtan a dit dans un petit livre, je crois, une certaine idée de Bill Maurice. C'était des articles qu'il avait écrits pour les journaux, pour le populaire, le journal dont il était le rédacteur en chef. Et à l'époque, il disait que normalement, il aurait dû être dans le parti travailliste. Parce que ses aspirations, sa vue de la société, les choses telles qu'il les comprenait, le menaient dans cette direction. Mais ce qui se passa, c'est que à un moment donné, la langue française à Maurice était menacée. Parce que à l'époque, les gens du Parti travailliste préféraient s'exprimer en anglais et aussi l'anglais qui était là, parce que nous étions un grand sujet britannique, l'anglais qui était là encourageait cela et la langue française était en danger. Alors il s'est dit, bon, il va entrer en politique et il va promouvoir la langue française et il l'a fait à travers le Parti Mauricien Social Démocrate, Allemand Mauricien à l'époque, avec Kenny et le concours de Raoul Rivette, le Mauricien et tout ça. Voilà pourquoi en français. Mais pour Gaëtan lui-même, lui-même, on m'a dit, vous savez, pas anglaise, beaucoup de personnes vont parler sur ce qu'il a fait en droit. Alors, limitez-vous un peu à quelques lignes brèves. Je vais essayer. Me revient de ce Gaëtan le sens d'abord de l'amitié. Pour moi, c'est l'ami. Parce que je suis l'ami, me revient d'abord le sens de l'amitié. Il avait la façon extraordinaire de donner son amitié. Je vais vous raconter ça. Nous sommes en 1975, en juillet. J'ai été avocat pendant trois ans en Jamaïque et je retourne à Maurice. Bizarrement, je retourne à Maurice parce qu'en Jamaïque, j'ai rencontré ceci ou cela à Angoulême. C'était une fête des High Commissioners, euh, des, oui, une fête pour les pays du Commonwealth, et il était venu en tant que Premier ministre. Je le rencontre, il me dit, il ah, me dit, il 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 me dit, je lui dis, bon, oh, je ne veux pas retourner. J'étais parti en 69, 68, juste après le bagarre racial, les élections, je lui dis, non, bon, mais non, je ne veux rien avoir. Mais en me l'a dit de retourner, je retourne, et quand je retourne, mes parents me disent il faut aller voir Gaëtan afin de vous exercer au bar, pour vous inscrire à l'exercice du bar. Je vais, je le vois, je rentre dans son bureau, la personne que je vois devant moi est un petit peu plus grande que moi, des cheveux du tombeau jusqu'à l'épaule, un visage gravitien, un ébusqué, des ailes charnues. La mine angleuse, en bas, je lui dis bonjour, maître du bal, avec mon accent jamaïcain. Et il me dit, si toi, mon coco, c'est le bon Dieu qui t'envoie, il fait ça, il gratte son poro comme ça, c'est sa manière, il fait, il secoue les cheveux. Je lui dis, mais comment ça, le bon Dieu qui m'envoie Il me dit, 
Je suis je cherche quelqu'un, je cherche quelqu'un pour être à mon bureau là, pour partager les affaires. Là. Alors, tu vas rester là, et crois-moi, tu vas bien faire, hein, j'ai l'œil. Alors je suis resté. Je suis resté dans le bureau de la hein. Et nous avons plaidé ensemble. À cette époque-là, ce qui était extraordinaire, c'est que nous étions en 75, et il n'y avait pas de chambers comme il y en a maintenant, à Maurice. En 75, chaque avocat exerçait pour lui-même, il n'y avait pas encore cette partie que les seniors prenaient un junior dans leur bureau pour les emmener avec eux en cours, non seulement pour les amener avec eux en cours, mais pour partager le travail. Alors c'était quelque chose d'assez inhabituel. Et un jour que j'allais en cours le remplacer, je rencontre au livré, une des premières fois que je le rencontre, et il me dit, pas en mais comment ça se fait-il Comment est-ce que ça se passe là, quand vous chambers, vous et du mal Les clients sont venus voir du mal, ils ne sont pas venus vous voir. Comment les clients vont accepter que ce soit vous qui veniez en cours pour les remplacer, pour remplacer du mal Vous voyez Et moi, nous en avons parlé, pareil que ça, le problème de la déontologie et de l'éthique. Nous n'avons jamais eu de problème à ce sujet, mais qu'il a accepté à l'époque. Et puis accepté parce que Gaëtan avait cette euh, façon de pouvoir persuader les gens et puis, comme il avait dit, il avait l'œil. <rire> Mais et Gaëtan avait une façon assez originale d'enseigner le droit, de m'enseigner le droit. Il m'a emmené en cours, la première fois il m'a emmené en cours, j'allais avec lui, et il, il comptait interroger. Et à la fin du contrat interrogatoire, se retourner vers moi et me dire Hein Qu'est-ce que tu as ajouté de toi Et à chaque fois, c'était comme ça. Et quand on retournait au bureau, il me redemandait Alors tu as dit Comment j'ai compté interroger Qu'est-ce que tu aurais dit de plus Qu'est-ce que tu aurais fait Voilà comment il m'enseignait. J'avais mal à m'asseoir à mes côtés pour me faire, me faire une lecture en droit. Non. Mais cependant, nous allions à la bibliothèque de la Cour suprême qui se trouvait en bas, la vieille Cour suprême. En bas, quand vous entrez, c'était à gauche, et il y avait mademoiselle Dossi, qui était la bibliothécaire, longue, mince. Et on allait là-bas, l'après-midi, parfois on restait jusqu'à 4 heures pour aller chercher quelque chose dans Garçon, ou bien dans Bassou, ou bien dans. Quand c'était le civil, c'était pénible, il n'aimait pas le civil. Alors, il est allé aller chercher, et j'ai découvert Garçonnier, ses embrus, et tendettes françaises aller chercher et lui montrer ça. Voilà comment j'ai connu un peu Gaëtan au début. Et puis, nous avons parlé ensemble dans des affaires difficiles. Mais une des affaires qui m'a le plus marqué, c'est pendant que je le défendais moi-même, et il était accusé d'avoir commandité l'assassinat d'une personne et il avait été arrêté, il était dans son procès à Flac, il fallait aller à Flac tous les jours pendant neuf mois, j'allais me casser. Et pendant qu'il est là, pendant qu'il est accusé, quelqu'un vient le voir pour qu'il défende cette personne. Je crois que c'est la chose la plus difficile qui puisse, qu puisse arriver à un avocat qui plaide, de se voir accusé soi-même d'un crime, et non seulement d'un crime, mais de quelque chose qui peut vous mener à l'échafaud et ici à la pendaison. C'était Sambou. Sambou avait été accusé. Et Gaëtan, accusé, bien sûr, à ça. Et Sambou vient le voir. Sambou est accusé d'avoir tenté à la vie de Jack Nath. C'est la vie de Jack Nath. Gaëtan dit, il va le défendre. Lui, il il est en train de faire face à la potence. Et quelqu'un vient le voir et il décide de défendre. Il faut avoir du courage pour faire ça. Gaëtan m'a toujours dit, la première qualité d'un avocat, c'est d'avoir le courage de son opinion. Mais aussi, moi j'ai réalisé, il faut avoir le courage de cours quand on est avocat. C'est important. Pas seulement votre opinion. Il faut avoir le courage. Gaëtan vient en cours. Avant ça, je lui parle. Je lui dis, Gaëtan, sans doute, avait de rêve. Voilà ce qui s'est arrivé à faire ça. Un jour, 
cani o gianna, vada tu su suo coscienza, gli dice che sta. Pendant qu'il y est, quelqu'un soudain arrive, la serre par derrière et prend un pistolet et le lui met à temps. Le pistolet est armé et qui est armé. Et le forcené dit, crie, t'as pas bougé, on peut tirer. Si tu ne pas écoute moi, si tu ne pas écoute moi. Vous vous tirez. Alors, avant d'aller, tu te vois là-bas, tu vas faire quoi Je dis, on va arracher là. Je dis, là, comment Mais il a le pistolet en main. Comment on va faire ça Tant qu'on arrive qu'à plainte, il vient déposer. Vous savez, il y a un maître en contact interrogatoire. Il est déjà plainte. Et il est interrogé d'abord par Balancy, par un des plus grands procureurs que j'ai jamais vu, peut-être le plus grand Balancy, très difficile à Et Balancy fait déposer son bout, euh, fait déposer Jacta. Jacta dépose clairement. Et Gartan va pas le compte interroger. Gartan se met debout, on regarde Jacta droit dans les yeux, et il dit. Huissier, donnez au témoin le revolver. Le juge aura. Le juge s'était pilé, un à pied. Et huissier tend le revolver à Jacques et à Jacques de moi. Montrez comment sommes-vous, vous a menacé. Jacques Nath s'exécute. Prend le revolver, il se met derrière la tête comme ça, il raconte, il est effrayé. Sans bouger, stipuler, crier. Hein? Le directeur lui dit Vous êtes sûr de ça Tu sais comment ça Il était dans le caractère de son naturel impulsif. Comment ça Il était là Il me menaçait Il est bien vu Le directeur dit Ah bon, vous avez bien vu Vous avez les yeux derrière la tête. Il était derrière lui. Voilà comment le seul de vous était moins cassé. Ce qui s'arrête. Il était extraordinaire, formidable. Et je ne vais pas prendre plus de temps. Je voudrais simplement vous dire, avant ça, la dernière affaire. J'étais avec lui, il est une affaire Bacha. Et il paraissait pour Bacha. Moi, je paraissais pour la cuisine de mon de sa Un matin, j'arrive au prétoire et je le vois, là, il est assis, il n'y a personne au prétoire. Il est assis tout seul. Je viens, je m'assieds à côté de lui, je lui dis alors, comment ça va Il dit, Boko, euh, alors on parle de choses de dessus d'elle, mais on regarde dans les yeux comme ça. Il avait des yeux très perçants et fascinants. Il regarde dans les yeux, il me dit, toi, où en es-tu avec mon livre Il me dit, mais tu n'as pas pour mon livre, il me dit, tu à moi. À chaque fois, on cause. Je le regarde. Il dit, oui. Je lui dis pourquoi tu me dis ça maintenant, là, 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 il m'attrape le bras. Je lui dis qu'est-ce que c'est ça Je lui dis, tu sais, tu me dis ça, c'est le champ du signe, ça, cette affaire. Il me regarde dans les yeux. Et il me dit simplement ceci, tu me promets de chanter le signe. Alors je lui dis. Mais pour finir, je voudrais vous dire et vous redire tout ce qui est écrit. Sur ce que j'ai fait dans les c'est passant, ne sois pas triste, je fais semblant d'être mort. Et, et à chaque fois, j'entends beaucoup de personnes qui disent ça. Mais la première fois que j'ai dit ça, c'était à la radio. Il y avait un monsieur qui s'appelait Gérard Manuel, qui faisait des émissions radiophoniques par appelait Club. Et c'était une de ses dernières émissions. Dans cette émission, elle demande à la mais qu'est-ce que vous auriez voulu voir sur votre tour Qu'est-ce que vous auriez, vous auriez voulu qu'on écrive quand on est pour vous Alors il a dit ça. Mais pourquoi est-ce qu'il a dit ça Parce qu'on ne soit pas triste. Il fait semblant d'être mort. La phrase vient d'un film. Pas de la phrase exacte, mais ça vient d'un film de Jean Cocteau. Le film s'appelle Le Testament d'Orphée. C'est un film 
dit ceci. À un moment donné dans le film, il y a Jean Marais qui marche et Jean Marais lui dit ces paroles. Faites semblant de pleurer, mes amis, puisque les poètes ne font que semblant d'être morts. Le sphinx, eux dit, ceux que l'on a trop voulu connaître, il est possible qu'on les rencontre un jour sans les voir. Ça c'était bon, Jean-Marie qui dit ça dans le film de Cocteau. Et lorsque Cocteau est mort en 1963, Jean-Marie est venu sur son sur sa dépouille et Jean-Marie a dit, tu vois, je ne pleure pas. Parce que maintenant, je ferai semblant de vivre. C'était marais et Cocteau. C'est des personnes qui avaient compris ceci. Une très grande vérité que l'on ne meurt pas. Personne ne meurt. On fait simplement semblant, tel que c'est écrit dans le Gita. Voilà, je vais vous citer le Gita. Chapitre 2, 22 à 23. Voilà ce que ça dit. Tel l'homme changeant de vieux vêtements pour des nouveaux. Celui résident dans le corps délaisse l'épuisé pour naître de nouveau. Nulle arme ne l'atteint, pas plus que le feu, ni l'eau, ni le vent. Perpétuel, omniprésent, stable, inamovible, ancien. Le corps ne meurt pas. L'esprit ne meurt pas. Quand le corps meurt, c'est ça que Gaëtan voulait dire, je suis un bidard. C'est semblant quand personne ne meurt. Merci. I would be rather short because we are nearing the end of this distinction. I must, uh, first of all, thank the Little Temple Association of Mauritius for giving me this opportunity to say what is to follow on the role Sir Gaëtan Duval played in the development of the law and of the legal system in Mauritius and the maintenance of the rule of law after our independence in 1968. Curiously enough, Sagaita was and still is better known for his uh, contribution, his influence on the development of the tourism and other industries in Mauritius more than what he did for the legal system in Mauritius. He was, and it is widely known, one of the best legal brains that Mauritius has produced. And yet, uh, almost very little known as to his all in the development of the law and the maintenance of the rule of law in Mauritius. His involvement in the legal field started with the formation of the first <coughs> coalition government when the PNSD and the Labour Party formed the first coalition in the 1970s. <coughs> My predecessor then was Paul Ann. The uh, contacts that Sagaida had with certain ministers in the French government at the time had seen the French government taking special care of our needs in, in, in Mauritius. We all know that our basic law uh, the, is the French Napoleonic codes. 
what that is civil or criminal. And we have had the good fortune of having professors from the University of Aix Marseille to come and deliver lectures to the to members of the legal profession, including uh, the members of, of the magistracy. And uh, when I was uh, in 1974 in the uh, magistracy, I attended those lectures. On top of that, what uh, Sir Gaëtan managed to, to obtain was to send some magistrates from Mauritius to attend the Ecole de la Magistrature in France, in Paris. And uh, a few of, of those uh, magistrates uh, have become judges after that. With the uh, advent of the second coalition government between the Labour Party and the Parti Mauritian Social Democrat, after the general elections in 1976, he uh, had left, first of all, the constituency of Kyopit, where his uh, political career started, to come to Portuis in uh, constituency number one, where he was elected, and for the uh, elections of 1936, he told me, well, constituency number one is uh, rather a safe one, and number four was a bit tricky, and I will go there. And he said, you were going to be, uh, I was I was going to, to uh, step in his uh, stead and be a candidate for the party in constituency number one. But then, two days before the nomination day, he came to me and said, I have a problem. We have had uh, a call from uh, a very able uh, candidate, but as I have uh, allotted the position in number one to you already, if you uh, agree to move to another constituency, I would take him, if not, I won't take him. So I said, who that uh, candidate uh, is? He said, he is Professor Lintan. I said, yes, but why does he want to, to, to stand in, in, in constitution number one? He said, he's rather old. You are a young, uh, young person. And uh, he wants to be there. If you don't move, we are not going to take him. So I said, well, a candidate of that caliber, caliber uh, we can't refuse to take him. So I said, where are you going to send me? He said, you can move to uh, constituency number two. And constituency number two, was rather a difficult one for the PNSD. I live in that constituency and I know and I know what the situation was. But I accepted in the end to go to constituency number two. Come the elections in 19 on the 20th of December, 20th or 19th, I'm not quite remember, but either or he moved to uh, Constitution number 4, and we, goes, we both got beaten in those elections in Portuguese, where the NMM uh, took all the 12 seats uh, which were available in Portuguese. After the result, 
right at the very end of the year, two or three days before, he came to me and said, we are going to have to form an alliance, a coalition government with the Labour Party, and we are having four ministers, including that of the Attorney General and Minister of Justice. And he said, I have already <coughs> got the party to accept you as the uh, next Attorney General and Minister of Justice. I was flabbergasted because uh, he was by far more experienced, better qualified to me to fill that post. And I said, well, uh, why don't you uh, take the post yourself? He said, no, I'm not going to, but you have to accept. I said, well, I can't take such a decision uh, just like that. I, at the time, I had my brother, I had my uh, in-laws, and I said, well, I'll give you my answer tomorrow morning. He reluctantly said, to exactly a day, and he added his swear word, a bad one, I must say, on top of that. I said, no way, I'll give you my answer tomorrow morning. This was how I, with barely three years at the bar, I had come to uh, return to Mauritius in 1971, January 1971, and he was the uh, Number one, as far as barristers is concerned in Mauritius, choosing me to be uh, the Attorney General and uh, uh, a Minister of Justice. I was flabbergasted, of course. But then, uh, this is how I became the Attorney General and Minister of Justice in 1976. And then he told me, on top of your uh, responsibilities as Attorney General, you will have to watch over a few things which uh, we as a party, we can't uh, not take care of. Because at the time, there was talk in certain quarters that the uh, ultimate appeal court of Mauritius was going to be changed. It was at the time, and it's in the constitution of Mauritius, the judicial committee of the Council. He told me that should not be changed, and uh, on top of that, there are one other major point in which you will have to uh, watch out that of the continued existence of the free, independent, religiously run uh, schools and colleges in Mauritius. This was a main point together with the uh, Judicial Committee of the Public Council being uh, the ultimate uh, court of appeal of Mauritius, on which you will have to watch out, and if we have any problem, and if uh, those two things are going to be changed, we will have to leave the government. Of course, being in the, in the profession for quite a while, he knew what he was talking about. And as things turned out, today, if those had been changed, if the director of public prosecutions had been uh, 
uh, uh, shown of its powers, of its independence, and if the uh, school, the, uh, the uh, independent school, free independent school, had been changed, especially uh, I speak, I, I, I talk about this especially as, as far as the uh, schools and colleges for the girls are concerned. The uh, only uh, college for girls which existed at the time uh, and which had been uh, founded in the 1960s was the Queen Elizabeth College. And today what do we see? The profession is almost, we are almost uh, at uh, equal in numbers as far as parishes and attorneys concerned. Even the magistracy and the Supreme Court now with there's not, 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 not much difference between the, the numbers of magistrates. They are there are more women in the magistracy and the uh, and the uh, Supreme Court than men. So, this is what I wanted to, uh, to tell you. I won't uh, go on the uh, other uh, uh, facets of his life, of his uh, uh, fight for independence of the judiciary and uh, for the rule of law. And uh, uh, this. Uh, what I want to be. I thank you for your attention.